Please turn with me in the back of your hymnals to the Belgic Confession, Article 5. Uh, you can find that on page 71 in the back of the hymnal. I am, as of today, lockstep with the uh, senior high Sunday school class, which uh, their topic today was on the Bible. They've entered a series on uh, challenges to the faith, and the particular challenge is the challenge of the Bible. So we'll be considering that uh, today. So page 71, uh, article number 5, uh, I will read that um, top, and then you and us, me, you and me, me together, can recite this article. Whence the Holy Scriptures derive their dignity and authority. We receive all these books, and these only as holy and canonical, for the regulation, foundation, and confirmation of our faith believing without any doubt all things contained in them, not so much because the church receives and approves them as such, but more especially because the Holy Spirit witnesses in our hearts that they are from God, and also because they carry the evidence thereof in themselves. For the very blind are able to perceive that the things foretold in them are being fulfilled. Nothing less than an emphatic statement from our Belgic Confession on the Word of God. A few passages to look at now. Um, I read uh, Exodus 19 on the reading of the law, and that is the mount where the Ten Commandments uh, were given, the beginning of God's written revelation, written by His own finger in tablets of stone, the very beginning point of written revelation. Now turn, if you would, to Hebrews 12, and Hebrews 12 compares the two mountains, and again, the two mountains, uh, uh, Sinai and Zion, are the two origins uh, of the two parts of our Bible, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Verse 18, for you have come, you have not come to a mountain that may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking." And that has to do with your pastor. Do not refuse him who is speaking, as long as he is speaking according to the written word. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he's promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Uh, now, if you would turn to Acts chapter 2, and the reason for turning to Acts 2 is to follow up upon the fact that from Mount Zion comes 
revelation. Uh, even as God formed the Old Covenant community at Mount Sinai, so too in Acts chapter 2, He forms the New Covenant community from Mount Zion, where Jesus is located in the heavenlies. And that forming of that covenant people is by way of word, covenant word, revelation, and spirit. Acts 2, 14 through 42. But Peter standing with the, now the Spirit's been poured out upon them, and now Peter standing with the eleven lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You've made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence." Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus... God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucify. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins." and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. One other passage to look at, just a brief one here, is 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21, having to do with the nature of Scripture.
And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture come from one's own interpretation. Well, that's, that's a tough translation. It should be source. No prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own source or own self. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, we pray now that your Holy Spirit indeed, the, the spirit of this book, would illumine our minds, convince us, and plant us in the faith in it. We need it, Lord, because apart from your spirit, we'll just continue to remain blind and unbelieving. So grant your spirit to us now that we might behold wondrous things from your law. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so the sermon title is The Bible, Can We Know and Defend It as the Word of God? Uh, you don't have to be uh, very familiar uh, with circles outside Christianity to be hit with the fact, if not downright clubbed with the fact, uh, that the Bible is a merely human book. Uh, and not only sometimes merely human, but even uh, on the level of some kind of a fantasy and could hardly comprehend why anyone would take it seriously. Well, with that perspective, it's no wonder that the Bible is left as a proverbial rubber nose to get out of it whatever you want for it for yourself according to the need of the moment. Now, Peter calls that twisting the scripture. Other people call that comforting your heart. Um, but it all depends upon what is the Bible. Is it a human document? Or is it something more? That is, is the Bible... As we read right here in 2 Peter, it doesn't take a whole lot of pizzazz to get out of 2 Peter the fact that Peter believed the Bible was the Word of God. Scripture is God's Word. And thus you should be taken with the utmost seriousness. Well, let's consider a little bit why we should identify the Bible as the Word of God. Uh, getting more general than a little more specific. <coughs> First, just generally, its historical reliability. Just looking at it in that light, um, you don't have to have a whole lot of knowledge to be able to recognize from reliable, objective, historical sources that the Bible is historically rooted. Uh, the Old Covenant comes from the Jews. Uh, very few people will try to argue that. And, and it's obvious. And it's no doubt that the New Testament uh, comes from a selected body of Jews. Historically. And that that is kind of a historical fact. That the Bible is not just kind of an upper story thing, like a, a fictional book, but is rooted in a people in time and in space and has and enjoys that setting. I mean, the Pharaoh of Egypt is mentioned and spoken of. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, Cyrus of Persia afterwards, even prophesies or speaks of Alexander the Great, the coming of the Roman Empire. And the Bible speaks of Pilate 
the governor at that time, and of Rome and its emperors, there is a historical groundedness to the Bible. For a long time, historians and archaeologists quibbled with the Bible over the people called the Hittites. I think the Bible talks about Hittites. There are no Hittites. Well, and sometimes I think it was in the 1940s or 50s. Guess what? Ta-da! <laughs> they discovered archaeological research. There are Hittites. The Bible is right all along. Amazing. And there are those who have done archaeology and, and, have, and have established sites by first going to the Bible and then looking for those sites and finding them. So, one of the most startling features was <clears throat> the work on covenant treaty patterns. All kinds of people were, for example, dating the book of Deuteronomy in the 7th century B.C., i.e. 1st millennium B.C., 700 B.C., um, putting it in the time of Josiah and whatnot. And then as research continued, they then began to find literary patterns of covenant treaties that were distinctive of the second millennium. That is, deeper than 1000 B.C., sometimes in the 12, 14, 15, 1600 B.C., and that the treaty patterns, <clears throat> international treaty patterns that they found archaeologically, guess what? They found that the book of Deuteronomy <laughs> reflected that very pattern. So my old professor, Meredith Klein, whom I appreciate, wrote a book, Treaty of the Great King, and, and showed that Deuteronomy follows the exact treaty pattern, no, not of the first millennium, second millennium, a pattern that passed away as they went into the first millennium, which means that Deuteronomy, what? Had to be a second millennium document and belonged around that period of time. Well, that supports the whole consensus of those who believe the Bible. I remember my dear professor saying, I gave up on converting liberals with that attempt because uh, they didn't take it seriously at all, even though the documentation was there in black and white for all to see. But the point is, is that the Bible is not just something lifted up like, you know, uh, little sayings uh, to benefit you in some way, like uh, you know, something from Confucius, you know, Confucius say this or that or the other thing. But it is a document that arises out of, out of and is identified with history itself. And as believers in this book, we affirm that and we are pleased to be able to say that. But moving on beyond recognizing its historical reliability is its internal claims. The Bible claims to be the Word of God. We read it in 2 Peter chapter 1. Later on in 2 Peter, in chapter 3, uh, Peter identifies Paul's writings with Scripture, puts them on par with Scripture, <clears throat> which is pretty amazing. But the Bible claims to be the Word of God. You have such language over and over again in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord. And you have the identification uh, within the Gospel accounts with Jesus and with Paul that the Old Covenant Scriptures are indeed Word of God. Uh, Second Peter, or I'm, I'm sorry, Second Timothy uh, chapter 3, when Paul is writing to Timothy, of course this is from... Uh, uh, foundational apostle to superstructure pastor, uh, what he should be referencing is the foundation for his preaching. He says to us, says, from childhood, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, with the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for, for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, all scripture, that is that received canonical body of Genesis through Malachi, is breathed out by God which is what Peter said of Scripture. It was from the Holy Spirit, the breath uh, of God. So the Bible claims to be Word of God. 
Now, the Bible doesn't claim to be Word of God in a non-historical, in non-organic sense, but it claims to be Word of God in a historical and organic sense. In other words, it's not all uh, dictation that God somehow spoke and people sat down and listened to the Lord in Rome. Now, some of it is that way. Thus saith the Lord. But bottom line is, the Bible though not dictated in whole, but only in very small parts, is nonetheless organically, by the Holy Spirit, at work in real human beings, communicated in human language. Now that's very important for us. The reason being is you and I are humans. And we understand the world around us by way of language. So when the Bible, that is God's speech, is put in human language, that's for our benefit. That's so that we can read it and understand it. And so the, the very words that are recorded and written in Scripture, though accomplished with human hand and human personality, in human effort, nonetheless, lying behind it, and as, as Peter says, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's the language of a, of, a, of a wind blowing in the sails of a ship, carrying it along. Peter says, those, the, the, those, those scriptures, those men were carried along by the Holy Spirit as they wrote out the Word of God, the scriptures for us. So the, the, it claims internally High claims. Now, the Belgic Confession points out something very interesting <clears throat> for us, and that is that the Bible has divine characteristics inbuilt. In other words, if you read it, there are characteristics that are characteristics that ring uh, by way of the Holy Spirit and the human heart with authority, and it rings with divinity. As a matter of fact, the character of Scripture itself is of such a divine character that the Spirit of God can enable you to open your eyes in such a way as to hear it for what it is. Now, this is something similar to, uh, you know, when you as a parent uh, call out to your child, say, Billy, uh, you just come into the kitchen now and begin doing the dishes. Well, Billy, you know, knows the voice of mom. Or Billy can get all philosophical. Hmm, maybe that wasn't the voice of mom. Maybe it was an angel pretending to be my mom. Probably was. And what does Billy do? He goes on playing his little game with trucks and cars and whatnot. Right? Then he hears again, louder. It's a little tinge of anger. Billy, I want you out here now and do these dishes. And again, he's got this ringing in his ears. That was mom. What does he need to persuade him it was mom? Step three, let's not go down there. Billy's in hot water. But the Word of God is very much like that, is it has characteristics of divinity in its very makeup so that it will ring in our hearts as from God and we can identify it by the work of the Holy Spirit in us. As the Belgic Confession says, even the blind get it, which is a little over the statement because in reality you need your eyes open to get it, but it's just saying it, you know, making the point, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> bringing it home. And also, there's this uh, internal cohesiveness. Uh, in other words, here we have something written over 1,500 years by over 40 authors, and it hangs together. Now, you know, that's an achievement that, you know, uh, I, I, would, I would challenge you to, 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 to just do over 100 years with 20 authors. But here the Bible, with 1,500 years of being written, with over 40 authors, has a cohesiveness uh, 
about what it's talking about. Yeah, there's some things that are hard to understand and grasp and penetrate, and it seems like this, it seems like that. Yeah, it's the nature of it. But at the end of the day, there's a great cohesion over the message of who God is, who you are, what God requires of you, what will happen if you ignore what God requires of you, and hear what God has doing as a way out back into his favor. I mean, that's a cohesive, constant message, which is an, inter an, uh, an internal uh, verification that this is from God. For who else could fit together all these nuanced puzzle pieces in this cohesive whole other than God himself? Thirdly, there's the external coherence. <clears throat> and we've considered this prior with regard to Isaiah 46 and 44, where, where God challenges the idols to be able to speak and, 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 and then bring to pass something in the future. In other words, God's challenge is uh, he who rules history uh, and demonstrates that rule is indeed God, and he is the one who actually accomplishes it. Now, the old covenant is of that very character with regard to Christ. Uh, and we have not just a couple uh, prophecies that might uh, satisfy, but we have what you know, we would say a plethora of prophecies, a, a, a fullness, many uh, lines uh, of, of the old covenant uh, converging together amazingly in Jesus Christ uh, who he is, his life, his miracles, what he does, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. Uh, all these things the Old Covenant uh, anticipates. Uh, just one thin line, Acts chapter 8. Remember the story of, of, uh, of the, the eunuch uh, uh, that was riding in the chariot reading the prophet Isaiah. Uh, you know. Now, that type of activity is kind of forbidden now in the 20th century, isn't it? Riding, uh, driving, and reading at the same time. But, but, but somehow those horses must have knew where they were going, I guess. Or, or there, otherwise he had the prophet in one hand and a rein in the I don't know what that looked like. But he was in the chariot reading the prophet Isaiah, and Philip was brought to him. And he, and he, and he said, well, what are you reading? He says, well, I, I, I'm reading, but I don't understand it. I need someone to help me here. And, and what's the passage but Isaiah 53? Isaiah 53, where the suffering servant. And uh, the question was, well, who is he speaking of? Is he speaking of himself or someone else? And, and it says that Philip did what he preached Jesus to him. It's about Jesus. And he was convinced, and he was baptized. That external providential coherence of the word with actual redemptive occurrence is persuasive. And so the eunuch was rightly uh, uh, one who believed and was baptized. And we have <clears throat> not only you know, God's providence in, in history and fulfillment of prophecy as an external coherence, but we have the testimony of people. We have a long, long testimony of people who have believed the Bible. We, we say uh, every other week in this church, the Apostles' Creed, an old uh, creed uh, going back over 1,500 years that the historic Christian church continues to say and believe which are the truths of Scripture. And, uh, and those who believe it uh, uh, over this long period of time have stood strong. I mean, your belief or your life, which is it? And uh, the preponderance of people who went down in flames or sword, believing, convinced as a testimony that their lives have been transformed practically in this world by this message. Their characters have been transformed by this message. Their hearts have enjoyed communion with God 
Now, all these things can be, of course, explained away, you know, oh, communion with God, just psychological phenomena of feeling good about, you know, what works for you or, or, or whatever. But if you put all these things together, they begin to lead you and point you in the direction of the Bible is indeed what it claims to be, and its message is indeed a message of truth. Fourthly, the Bible gives us exclusive and comprehensive answers to life's questions. And what I mean by exclusive, the Bible gives answers to life questions like no one else or from nowhere else, which makes it a very distinctive, yet it is a comprehensive answer. It's a big, it's the whole with its parts to the big questions of life. What's the nature of reality? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All of reality is one of two things. It's either creation or crea creator. It's one of those two things. That's the nature of ultimate reality. God himself. What's the nature of man? The Bible says he's made in God's image. He has great dignity. And isn't that true that within the impulse of all human beings, except for a few psychopaths, that they would not want to intentionally harm another human being? Though they do all kinds of harm in the name of justice and whatever. But there is within the human heart, even though fallen, the sense that human beings are important, valuable Beings that should not be hurt, but should, whose life should be uh, encouraged and nurtured and, and continued. There's just that impulse. Well, where's that impulse come from? Does it come out of time and chance and evolutionary process that this bag of chemicals and water valuing if you break it down and sell it out, maybe you get three, three, four bucks for all the chemicals that are in the human body? Is, is, is that at the end of the day on a, on a basis of mere chemical analysis valuable? You have this inner compulsion that, you know, I should not hurt you, I should not damage you, I should not hit you, I should not step on you, I should do what I can to care for you and show care. Where does that come from? Well, the Bible answers that beautifully. He says we're made in the image of God, and we all know it. We just some suppress it, that's all. But we know we're made in God's image. And secondly, not only that we know we're made in God's image, but we have a duty, an ultimate duty to God. C.S. Lewis gives a pretty little interesting ar argument in mere Christianity. That, uh, where in the world does this ethical sense come from that we all seem to agree on? Where does that come from, Lewis asks. And he argues quite persuasively. They can only come from one place. It comes from God, this universal ethic that we all share together. It comes from the fact we're in God's image, but there are also, along with that universal sense of ethic, there's an awareness that I haven't always kept it all the time, at least. Of course, the clearer it becomes, the clearer, you know, you realize it's not just a few blunders I made, but, you know, Eventually, you'll get to the point you say, I'm blundering every day of my life. You know, you might think, wow, what an, what an awful view of yourself. Well, the Bible calls that an enlightened view of yourself. It's a, a true assessment and realization of yourself. But nonetheless, man is made in God's image, yet, and he has a duty toward God. He has a duty toward people. He has a duty toward work. He is to procreate. The opposite sex, of course, uh, until that's suppressed as well. And praise God, no one's going to put handcuffs on me or take me out of here for saying that. And all these things are part and parcel of life. And the Bible, what? The Bible says, yeah, that's how life works. And we think of what, what is man's problem. He has great dignity, but he also has great depravity. He has a problem of sin, and the Bible points that out. It gives us the Ten Commandments through the laws, the knowledge of sin, which we read in church every Sunday to, to remind us of our great need for the Redeemer and to bring us to faith in Him and confidence in Him. Because, why? 
The Bible tells us of the answer to our big problem. It's Jesus Christ. He's come and done something about it. He satisfied God's justice on his cross. And we all have this inner sense of justice because we carry out our lives with this inner sense of justice. And that inner sense of justice that condemns us and accuses us, guess what? Christ has borne it that you might be forgiven, reconciled to heaven, and have newness of life in him. That's the declaration of the answer to man's problem. And also the Bible gives us a future. We're not just going to go back to the dust and disappear and, oh, well, you know, whatever happened, happened in my life. I'm going to disappear someday and not be around anymore. From dust to dust, isn't that what the Bible says anyway? <laughs> You've heard that. Well, the Bible tells us there's a future. The God who made the universe holds us accountable and, is hold, and holds before us this great future, but also holds out judgment. Well, all these things are a very, you might say, world and life view that is exclusive and distinctive to what the Bible says. And the more you look into it, the more it rings in its content with this is true about life and all these other options, whether it's the inane idea that somehow we get something out of nothing or that we get order out of total chaos or that aliens will eventually make their appearance and explain everything to us and rescue us. Or that Star Trek Enterprise is going to circle around and come back and pick us up, for those who are ready. But those things are crazy. you gotta be, you got be, to be kidding me. Aliens? <laughs> Order out of chaos? Ultimate? I'm just going to go back from dust to dust? And now I'm supposed to, what, have a meaningful life? And oh boy, all is fine and well? Well... That's craziness. But the Bible gives us this exclusive, comprehensive world and life view that, that fits everything and gives us this sense of no wonder the Creator speaks to His creation. He who knows everything explains a part of what I need to know in this life. And thus I am persuaded that it is true. And lastly, the Bible has, and this is, you might say, in many ways, <clears throat> the point of all points. It has its own self-authenticating character and content. For what is the Bible, after all? So I hold that book in my hand. What is it? Well... It's the Word of God, and that is right on target. But it is not just the Word of God. It is the covenantal Word of God. And then you might say to me, oh, you have to say that because you're a Reformed pastor, and you got that out of seminary. Well, why don't you just look at the table of contents in your Bible and see what it says? The Old Testament and the New Testament. The very Bible itself says what? It is the Old and the New. And the word testament is just an attempt to translate the Greek diatheke, which is a weak translation. It ought to be really covenant. The Bible is God's Word, which is the Old and New Covenants. And those words were addressed first. The beginning of the Bible is where? You say Genesis 1.1, and I'll say no. That, that's where you begin to read. <laughs> the beginning of the Bible historically is on Mount Sinai, the giving of the Ten Commandments, where with his finger he put it in tablets of stone. Why? That we might know that this is the Word of God. The beginning of written Scripture is directly by the Spirit of God into stone tablets. So that all the rest of written Word of God partakes of its distinctive character. 
whether or not it was dictation or just organic writing as the Spirit carried them along. But it came from Mount Sinai. You see, that's the Old Covenant. And that's, that's where a people was bound to the Lord. And the people that were bound to that Lord said, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. And along with that, they were given animal sacrifices. So what is the message of the Old Covenant? You can say the message of the Old Covenant is simply that. God's law says keep it and you'll live. Break it and you'll die. But there's another message to the Old Covenant. You need a spotless lamb. And the reason you need a spotless lamb is because you didn't keep it. Nobody keeps it. And so the Old Covenant, you see, is looking forward in its very character to a lamb that will do something about our sins. And that lamb arrived in history. That John the Baptist, the last of the Old Covenant prophets, said what? Behold! the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The very thing the Old Covenant was begging for, the Lamb that would deal with our law-breaking sin, John the Baptist says, He's here! <laughs> and so we have in history, Jesus Christ crucified under Pontius Pilate, risen again, pouring out His Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, to reproduce the new covenant community by way of word and spirit. The beginning of the new covenant revelation happened on Pentecost, eventually was put into print, not all of it, but a portion of it, that we now have with us as the foundation for the new covenant community, Matthew through Revelation. The Old Covenant looked forward to the great historic event of Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners, and the bringer of the future of heaven. And the New Covenant, Revelation, looks back to Jesus Christ. And that great historical event, expositing it, opening it for us to understand and to believe. There is, you see, in the very character and the content of the Bible, a self-authenticating character that this is indeed the Word of God that not only convicts us of sin, law, but points us to the Savior, gospel. Isn't it interesting that Eusinus, the composer of the Heidelberg Catechism, said that the Bible has two parts, law and gospel. He was exactly correct. And those two components are, at the end of the day, self-authenticating. They come from heaven with an authority and a power and a clarity and an obviousness. Like the Belgic Confession says, even the blind should be able to get it. Can we know and defend the Bible as the Word of God? You betcha. Try on the spectacles of the Bible. Everything will look new. Everything will look different. I've been living with this book we call the Bible for almost 50 years of my life. And all the way back at the beginning of that journey, I had a man, a black man, named Sam Dalton. And he said to me, a bunch of other teenage boys, he says, look, boys, he said his old thick hands, and he said, boys, this book will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from this book. I never forgot it. Yeah, this book will keep me from sin. First, by pointing out my sin. <laughs> but secondly, by pointing out my Savior <laughs> who saved me from my sin. And then I had another black man, again, my youth leader, the beginning of my days. These two black men said things to me that have stuck with me all along. 
His name was Odessa Williams. And Odessa used to have a Bible that he had all wrapped up in newspaper as a cover. It's kind of odd. And then one day he stood and he said to the youth group, he said, look, he says, I have this wrapped up in this newspaper. You know why? Because this is good news. Matter of fact, this book is Jesus in black and white. And it's good news. And I never forgot that. And brothers and sisters, I pass that on to you. Sin will keep you from this book. And this book will keep you from sin. Because this book is Jesus Christ in black and white. And his saving power, his transforming redemption will be released into your life as you feed on this book. You know why? Because it is the word of God. It has that power. And that power has been going on since God spoke let there be light. And as he continues to speak into hearts through the gospel of Christ, may light shine in our hearts, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so Peter finishes his epistle referencing Scripture. First, Peter says there are those who twist the Scriptures, and they twist them to their own destruction. And I mentioned that earlier on in this sermon. But Peter goes on to say this about those scriptures. Grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray.